Welcome to the Modern Mythos Podcast, a show dedicated to the keepers and players of Call of Cthulhu and other investigative horror games. I'm John Hook. And I'm Seth Gorkowski, and together we'll discuss writing, game mastering, and player tips and how to apply them to your table. Today we discuss failure in your games, and we're going to begin a project where we start designing a Call of Cthulhu adventure, and I kind of let you listen along as we go through that process. Yeah, that's going to be a lot of fun. Very interactive and uh, they'll get to see the the highs and lows, the peaks and valleys as we uh, as we do that. Oh, my favorite part is I have no idea what we're going to do yet. <laughs> so, I know. That's the great thing, gonna right? We're going to discover it as we go along. But first, uh, what I want, one, of the, uh, one of the topics I want to talk about is uh, failure in, in tabletop role-playing games. You got all these roles. Sometimes you, you fail them. Um, and this is actually concerning a trend that I've seen in several uh, different games out there recently where failure is not an option, where there is no failure uh, within certain aspects of the game. Um, and then kind of break that down into how other games handle failure and how, how game masters can can work whenever you know, the, the players just their dice are not cooperating. Uh, with whatever they're doing that day and and how we how we handle it because uh, you know I came from the old school where you know failure always equaled the worst possible thing uh, you know if you if you failed a client check you fell uh, if you know you if you you failed to uh, find the trap you you definitely hit the trap you know there was no uh, middle ground and things like failing forward and all that were, were concepts that man i didn't know about for many years well and i mean maybe it's ignorance but i feel like in the early days of role playing um there wasn't that uh gray area in failure it was very black and white uh you know we were rolling d20s and if you didn't get your number if you failed it was a miss or if yeah. you uh, attempted to find that secret door and you didn't get the number, which was, you know, you know, without whatever that range may have been, like maybe a one to two on a six out of die and you rolled a five, you didn't find the secret door. So, you know, it was just simply black and white. You either you were successful or you were not successful. And there I don't think there was that. Uh, at least I wasn't aware of that concept of the gray area in uh, degrees of failure or even degrees of success. I really feel like this is a concept that has uh, grown as role playing has matured and as games have become you know, uh, game design has become more complex and more uh, innovative. And, you know, maybe even with, I, I feel like this uh, this concept of, of failure is not an option is something that really was much more prevalent in like these uh, story driven games. But I, you know, well, I'm hypothesizing there. Uh, to, to give an example, and this was uh, one of the first times I really, really read that that was specifically how it was uh, designed, is uh, it, uh, the Dystopia Rising uh, role-playing game. And uh, so they've, they have a little quick start, and they've got the, the rules, and I also have the, the rule book for it. And in their, their quick start adventure, uh, which is you know, called Trouble on the Steel Pier, uh, they had a couple examples of when uh, the player characters would be making a skill check and then the consequences. And if memory serves, there's the degrees of success. Uh, it kind of like how powered by the apocalypse and other games do it. There's total failure, uh, failure with consequences or you know, total success or success with consequences or total success. And so one of them is they're uh, searching a, uh, like a crime scene and there's a clue and it's like a, a syringe or maybe a test tube or something. And there's something written on it. And if they have a total failure, they rolled as bad as you can be. They still found it. It's just that they stepped on it and it, it cracked the syringe, but they were guaranteed to find it. And, you know, I read that and I was like, okay, you know, I've done a lot of mystery games. I know what happens if we're trying to do a mystery and they miss the clue we're done. So, okay, I get that. That's, that's, that's cool. 
Um, but then later on, uh, the player characters are trying to get into a casino or a bar or something. And there's a big bouncer at the door. And the bouncer doesn't want to let them in because they're not the right people. And so they, if they, when they try to persuade their way past them, uh, you know, total success lets them in. But total failure, uh, you know, absolute worst role is he lets them in. And they can go in. They can meet the person they want to meet. They can do what it is they need to do. They can get the adventure hook, get the job, whatever, whatever. And then once that's done, the bouncer and some other guys grab them and throw them out and they take away any winnings they might've had while they were in, in the casino, but they still make it inside. And that was where it really jumped out at me because I've played countless games where but it ended up being the most exciting part of the game was trying to get into that damn casino because the bouncer wouldn't you know, let them in. And all of a sudden, you know, they're, uh, they're paying off a guy at the door or now they're wearing elaborate costumes or now they're going across some sort of wire or rope from the neighboring building or, or some sort of a, a elaborate something to, to make up for the fact that they failed the first option. But, but here we have a game where you're not even going to get that. It's, it's always going to let you in. And that is, is where it seemed really weird to me. Yeah, that does seem weird uh, because especially in that situation where your characters have to, you know, get past a person who's like guarding a door, you know, um, and that that kind of scenario happens in a lot of games, right? Sometimes the yeah. guard is an orc. Sometimes that guard is a bouncer, right? Yeah. But there should always be an alternative to getting in if you get to, if you fail your persuade or your fast talk to get through the front door maybe on a failure that's when you notice the catering group the catering van has just pulled up and, and is pulled around the corner you know um there should be other options and other methods to to get in or maybe if you fail that's when your eye catches uh the light kind of shining along that uh uh power line uh that's connected from a pole you know this corner pole to the to the building you know now you gotta shimmy the pole and cross the line and you know something right but just uh like oh you failed the roll all right well still come on in that that does seem a little odd and so with you know with failing fo forward whenever i've tried to explain it my my kind of standby explanation is usually your your character is trying to jump across a chasm and the chasm is you know, it's super deep it's it's 100 feet and there's lava at the bottom but uh so falling down it is guaranteed you will die but they failed the jump roll uh so it's like okay you're hanging off on the other side by your fingertips uh and now we can do some further rolls to get you out of this but it's like you 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 didn't die we're, we're gonna do something um or you make it across but this uh thing you know, your weapon or whatever uh slipped and fell down and it tumbles and you know gets consumed by lava and now i've taken something valuable from you as as the cost but we're still across and uh, and i like the idea of failing forward you know my, my my games have actually gotten a lot more exciting and and versatile because it has that middle ground option versus the way that i did it for many years which was like well fail the jump you're dead so it's it, it it is better however i think that there's kind of an inclination to never seal the deal of you know if 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 you have your character jump across and they grab the edge of the chasm and they're trying to get up. It's like, okay, make your, your strength. If somebody's trying to, and they fail. And then and they, they fail and they fail. At some point, I, I feel that you need to fall into the lava. At some point, the promised threat that you've promised them needs to be fulfilled. Because once players realize that you're never going to actually go through on the promise, it loses the excitement. It does. It does. Um, I actually uh, can give a little example. Uh, I was playing uh, Swords and Wizardry, and uh, and that game, you know, is very much a, it's an old school uh, like uh, original like white box edition D and D kind of clone. And 
there are no skills in it, but because of my comfort in having skill roles, I've kind of developed and added skill checking into that game. And uh, so I had these characters trying to cross, as you said, it was a chasm. Uh, they were they were trying to go across a a, a fallen tree that had that had gone across, you know, bridged the chasm. And there were monsters coming and all that stuff. So they, they were trying to cross it in duress. And so this one character, you know, I had them uh, roll their skill, you know, that I was kind of uh, creating for the game. Had them uh, roll a dex check to try and make it across. Two of the characters were successful. One character failed. Well, because he failed, I said, okay, now I need you to do, a, do another check. Uh, or I had him do a strength test now to see if you can you because you fell onto the onto the tree. Now make another strength test. See if you can hold on tight. So he rolled again and he failed that one. And so my buddy, uh, one of the other players, said, "I want to throw my grappling hook and and see if he can grab that." I said, "That's a great idea." You know, yeah, that's that's a case where the GM's like, "Thank you." Yeah, yeah like because like I need you to do something because I'm running out of options. <laughs> right. So he goes, he goes, "I'm going to throw the grappling hook." I said, "That's perfect. The grappling hook is going to make it, but I need the character to roll another dexterity test to see if he can grab the grappling hook." Right. And I I was I wasn't going to have him roll both to throw and to catch. I just I just made it one of them, just catch. So still the target player. I wanted him to save himself basically with his own die rolls. So he ended up being three sets of die rolls. It was a dex, it was a strength, and then it was another dex. And he failed all of them spectacularly. And honestly, you look at the odds and it was like a 50-50 chance for each one of them. But he failed on all of them. And I was like, you fall into the chasm. And he's no. like, I mean... That was it, right? You, know, you can't you can't just give everything away. But I, I kept trying to give him all these options, and I was like, "You fall into the chasm, man." <laughs> He's like, <laughs> "Yeah, all right." But on Usually the other by side, that point, your, your makeup character is just—he was already camping on the other side. Yeah, I, usually at that point, the player is like, "Just, just kill me." Just the shame of all these these die rolls. Um, so then uh, another game, and kind of the the contemporary uh, games is uh, Kids on Bikes, uh, where it's uh, kind of a 1980s, kind of based off, you know, the old uh, Spielberg movies like Goonies or Stranger Things, you know, that sort of thing like that. And in that game, if you fail a skill roll, it's like, okay, you failed, but then you get uh, what's, what's called uh, an adversity token, which you can cash in uh, for, for a plus one later on. And they're actually powers that you need to use adversity tokens to like activate. So you, you don't get to do them unless you've, you've failed skill checks. So, but you know, then you have this, this other system will allow you to fail, but you will always get a, a reward when you fail. And that one always, that one seems weird to me as well. Um, you know, I've done a house rule when we, we did cyberpunk where whenever they fumbled, you know, they had to fumble it. They got one improvement point, uh, which is on that particular skill. Cause it's like, you screwed up so bad, but you learned something because, you know, anytime in real life, I've ever really, really screwed the pooch on something. I did learn a valuable lesson of what never to do again. So I, I would give them like an automatic, you get one IP for a fumble, but I wouldn't for a failure. It was just failure. Uh, so I, I also find it kind of odd in this game where you're you're immediately given a reward for failure, whether it's a massive failure or a mild failure. How do you how do you feel about that? Yeah, I I do like the idea on a fumble that the uh, you know burned hand teaches best. So you could get a uh, uh, an improvement point or a a bonus of some sort for a fumble a straight failure getting a getting a reward for that um that feels like game on easy mode to me you know yeah. um and i'm not sure 
if the players, I guess it would be my assumption that the players would lose uh, their investment in the game because it would feel too safe. It would feel like, eh, doesn't really matter if success or fail. Everything's still going to work itself out, you know? At which point, you may as well just read the story instead of play the story, you know? Yeah, and, you know, so, yeah, like, now with both of those, like, combat was, like, kind of, like, the exceptional. Kids on Bikes, I think you still got an adversity token if you failed, like, a two-hit roll. But, like, and, uh, and Dystopia Rising, like, combat was combat, like, like anything else. It was just, like, everything that wasn't combat, like, your regular skill rolls uh, was the, like, you, you always passed. And because, you know, I, I whenever I look at sample adventures, uh, that's one of the things that I, I really pay attention to is like, this is how, you know, the, the game is supposed to be run. You know, whenever they give a, a a quick start or something like that, it kind of walks the GM through the rules. I also look at that as like, this is telling the GM that in the future, when you're, when you're writing your own stuff and whenever you're running this game from now on, this is how the game was designed to be run. So, you know, that's why I, I look at those cases of, uh, failure is always rewarded or failure is never an option. And basically my enthusiasm toward the game wanes. It's part of the reason when, when we played a uh, fifth edition D and D, you know, our players were having a blast with it. And I figured out a couple sessions before them that, that death in that game, I thought was kind of an accomplishment uh, because it's like, I don't think they can, I don't think they actually can die here. Uh, and we, we finally had a really brutal combat because I was just going to try to push to the limit. And then they made it worse for themselves back that, and they succeeded. And afterwards they're like, I don't think we can die in this game. And it's like, yeah, I don't think you can either. And immediately their own feeling of accomplishment for all those har har you know, harrowing uh, combats that we had for the previous several months dimmed because like, oh, well, I guess, I guess we really weren't you know, in the type of danger we thought. Um, and, and that's kind of how I feel about games where there is never going to be the fulfilled promise. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then uh, another one I did was uh, uh, Octung Cthulhu, uh, of Indifius, the 2D20 game. And in that is an adventure called A Quick Trip to France, where your, your characters parachute into this occupied, you know, small French town and you have to stop, you know, the, the evil Nazi cultists. And, you know, when, when you're going through it, like you have to sneak through the town at one point and you, so you make your stealth checks because you're trying to get to the far side of the town where the resistance leader is. And if you fail, uh, even though there's like bad guys creeping around this town, nothing happens. It's just like at a window, you see one of the residents of the town, like, like peer out the window and like close the curtain. And, and maybe that'll like give him like a, Oh no, we were spotted, but it, but these are also people of an occupied town. They're probably not going to be calling the authorities. Uh, they're, you know, they, they might offer aid. Um, it's so it's not like, like, oh, if you get seen, you might have to flee from a patrol or, you know, all of a sudden, like, you know, there's uh, shouts and, you know, bells clanging. And now you've got to sprint so far in order to, to lose the bad guys again or, or something like that. It was just, uh, you see a curtain pull back and somebody peer out the window at you and then move the curtain back. And that was it. That, that was the, 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 the big consequence for failure. Um, <laughs> um, now earlier in the game, they did have one where if, like, basically if you failed jumping out of an airplane, like the opening scene is you jump out of an airplane into France, you know, it, it has like, you know, if you, if they fail, you know, it's like maybe they get caught in a tree or maybe they, you know, miss their, their target. So it's like, okay, I get that because it literally opens with, you are going to jump out of an airplane at night. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not really the type of, of G where it's like, well, you failed, you splat. And then like another parachute comes down and that's your new character. Um, <laughs> so like, so I get the idea of failure, not being an option. And we're going to do a fail forward instead for something like that, but not the sneak through the town. Yeah. Because, yeah, I, th I feel like the stakes for immediate failure are are lessened. Uh, so we 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 do have that, like, okay, well, the, 
uh, a, a guard hears you or that somebody walks up to inspect what they saw and now you've got to do a stealth or you've got to take them out or something before they sound the alarm and if they mess up maybe the guy sounds the alarm and say like, okay now you guys got to run uh, or or some sort of consequence because it all started with a failed stealth roll um and i think one of the best pieces of advice that that i've, I've, I've heard recently about uh, a lot of stuff was if uh if a if a game master can't accept uh, both success and failure for a skill roll. You know, if they, if they're like ask for a skill roll and they succeed, they're like, oh damn, I, I, I don't want you to succeed. You know, such as, you know, I seduce the dragon or I, I don't, I don't want failure because I don't want you to just die or, or whatever doing this. Then they shouldn't ask for a skill roll or, uh, it is a, a case where it is, it will be a fail forward. And, and that's really when I think it should be a fail forward. Like if you can't accept failure, you're actually just checking to see what is the degree or the cost for success rather than being failure. Um, and that's kind of my measurement of when to do it personally. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. Uh, the, the advice I've heard it, um, uh, given as is only ask for die rolls when failure would be interesting. You know, so if it's if failure wouldn't be interesting, then don't ask for the die roll. Just go ahead and and have your players narrate. You know that um, thinking about the situation of sneaking through a town, you know, trying to do the stealth thing. In that scenario, you know the I would think that the the adventure would be written as you have you have your ideal path that would be heir apparent to soldiers who are trying to, you know, airdrop into an area and then through the cover of darkness, make their way to, you know, point A, okay? When you attempt that, that stealth roll, failure would mean that that path, that ideal path to get to your destination is not available to you there's the patrol or there's something going on, you know, there's dogs or something in the area. You can't go that way. Now failure means you're redirected to another path that has its own inherent obstacles for you to get around. But it's because, you know, a skill check at this point is what determined which path you get to take, yeah. you know? So it's like, now you got to go this other way, but you have to climb, fences you have to climb uh, fences you have to get past this you, you know there's other obstacles in way in the way uh there's a there's uh the yellow king rpg i actually thought about this as you were talking so but in the yellow king rpg um combat which is very unique it's very interesting for those who have not played the yellow king rpg uh combat is a single die roll by all of the active participants in that fight you just make one fighting check and as game master uh you go down the line player by player and there is a there is a particular order that you go in uh but you determine the order and then as, as the game master is going player by player and asking for the fighting role the fighting role is I it's 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 gonna be Boolean, it's gonna be black and white, it's either success or failure. Okay, no no gray. Um, if it's a su success, that's great. And you you know how you know how many uh uh steps above the target number, you know, the, the game master is figuring all that out. But you know, the game master is is keeping a combat log for each combat. And so as you go player by player, you're figuring out roll your die, was it pass or fail, and you keep going. In the For every player who's involved in the combat, once all players have, have done rolling, the Game Master goes back to the beginning of the combat line and says, okay, you rolled your, your die roll and you were successful. The Every monster, every opponent that you're battling in Yellow King has what's called a toll. There, there is a toll for fighting these these oppo <clears throat> these opponents. Uh, 
and you have to ask the player, do you want to pay the toll? Now, if your combat roll was a success and you choose not to pay the toll, then whatever the hazard is, whatever the, the, the penalty is, uh, the penalties come in a minor penalty and major penalty. And if you were successful in your, in your fighting role and you choose not to pay the toll, then you are awarded the minor penalty. If you pay the toll, you don't get any penalties because you were successful. If you failed your, and this is where passing and failing is kind of doing that divergent path, right? Failure, you know, successes go one way and failures go the other. If you failed your combat role, you are looking at the major penalty, whether it was a physical penalty or a mental penalty, depending upon the type of opponent you're fighting. And so you're like, you're looking at the major penalty here. Do you want to pay the toll? And if they say, yes, I'll pay the toll, then they get downgraded to the minor penalty. If they say, no, I don't want to pay the toll, or you're unable to pay the toll, they take the major penalty. And so I like how uh, your pass and fail has game consequences in that type of situation. You know, it's not just... Yeah. It's not just a failure, and it's not it's not really failing forward because it's there's a penalty involved. Uh, anyways, I just thought of that as we were talking. I thought that'd be germane to the conversation. No, because I, I, like I said, and, and all these are so different than than how I played for many years. Uh, you know, like, like concepts like failing forward, you know, I would do every once in a while whenever I basically, when I would ask for a die roll that I actually couldn't accept failure on because it was just going to, to end the game, uh, which would be like, you know, they follow the thing. It's like, uh, yeah, give me a, another dex to see if you grab the edge and then the strength to pull yourself up. Okay, we're saved. Or, or you know, maybe like you automatically grab the edge, give me a set strength to pull yourself up. Uh, but I never actually saw that as like regular advice um, probably really until the last 10 years when I kind of stuck my head out and saw whatever new games and uh, what the community was talking about at that time. I had, um, I'd never seen it. I had just kind of had my version that I was kind of sporadic mm -hmm. on using. Um, you know, I also, that was also the first time I ever saw the rule written out of like, if it's not actually an important role, don't bother rolling. Like, you know, if I'm going to drive to the store, don't make a drive check, uh, which is which was like, wow, that would have saved us a ton of motorcycles. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, newer games are addressing uh, failure in, in the rules itself. Uh, the Alien RPG, it actually has a, a box uh, that addresses failure. And it, it basically talks about that failure of a skill should not uh stop the story it, it 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 puts in black and white it says your story must continue to move forward uh so it tries to help the game master you know describe ways where that failure still allows the story to move forward maybe the task uh was not accomplished but the story will still move forward uh so you know Games are addressing this. There's another great game, Blades in the Dark. And they also have a section where it says failing gracefully. And it actually also advises the game master that assuming that you're just learning Blades in the Dark, it says don't worry about all the details. Just, just play the game. And as you and the players get more familiar with the game, you can start integrating some of the more granular and more detailed rules and don't let failure of your skills prohibit you from accomplishing the uh, the story let the task fail but the story will continue so the you know games are starting to integrate this uh concept of failing forward and bring it into the uh, into the rules itself now, like I said, I still feel that there should be the the fulfilled promise. Uh, so, you know, Call of Cthulhu uh, does push trolls, which I love. I absolutely love the the push troll mechanic. Um, 
you know, first, whenever a player does a skill check, it is not you know, absolute failure. You know, you fail your climb check, it could be, you know, they, they look at the wall and say, ah, uh, you don't see anywhere to climb, you know, or it could be, uh, you, you know, they're, they're kind of like, they, they start up a bit and they're like, nah, nah, I don't have it. And then there's the push stroll option, which, you know, that's, your, that's the ejection seat. They can say, now I'm good. I'll do something else or we can push it. And the consequence for the push stroll is the, the, the fulfilled threat of, of, of some way. There is a definite cost uh, involved. So that could be, uh, well, I'm going to try to climb it because they describe how they're going to approach it differently as like, you fall or uh, you, you definitely get spotted by the bad guy or, or something like that. Now, once again, in investigative games where there is like a critical clue that you have to have in order for the story to move, um, I'll often do those as a cost. You know, the bad guys are now know that you're looking into them. Um, you knocked over the shelf in the library, like Evie from the mummy. And, <laughs> you know, like, you know, you got only the critical thing out of the library. You didn't get all the, 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 the added cool stuff you know because it's like there's the degrees of stuff you can find where there's like this is the one they absolutely have to have to move forward and here's five other cool things they can find it's like, you found the one that you have to have those five other cool things are now buried in mountains of books and fallen shelves as like you know they're 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 coming after you with a broom handle because you just destroyed the library or whatever it is so i do like the mechanic of the pushed roll but and I do understand the story needs to move forward, such as, yes, I have had a D&D dungeon end where they had to find a secret door. And it's like, yeah, you rolled a D6. It was like, you know, two, one to two, you got it. And elves, it was like one to three. And nobody got it. And we're like six players. Nobody found the secret door. That's it. Okay. And I, you know, I'm, I'm struggling. There was, you know, I, I didn't know or even consider the concept of, well, I'm going to let them have it because you know we we came here to play but at a cost uh, so i love the fact this has actually been introduced in my arsenal but at the same time i don't like the idea that you always succeed at everything with a cost or you know like you're you're never going to to fail um because sometimes i think they need to fall down the chasm oh yeah uh, and, yeah. and that way, when you do have the, you're always going to get it, but at a cost is, is, is the final thing. Uh, those aren't as obvious as you just always succeed no matter what. Um, like, so I, I really do feel there's, there is a balance that GMs have to figure out uh, because no, I don't want to. I hate killing characters. I hate dealing with the player who's upset that their character died. I hate trying to figure out how to work their new character in. I, I hate my disappointment because, you know, I, I like that character. I liked where they were going. I was looking forward to what they were going to be, you know, evolving into. I, I don't like doing it. But sometimes, uh, basically for the game and, and to keep that, uh, that, that tension and that fear, I have to, um, but I'll, I'll, in those cases, I'll try to avoid it first, but at some point I'll do it. And it, it's that reminder of, yeah, there's, there is real risk or yeah, they will fail the adventure. Um, there's a real risk, but not, not necessarily all the time. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah. I, I would much rather, uh, allow my my players to have that uh, fulfillment of failure in a dramatic fashion where they could say that they attempted to, to be that guy who stood in front of the tsunami to stop it from, you know, striking the city and got crushed by the waves more so than the guy who slipped and fell down a stairwell and broke his neck. You know, oh yeah. Uh, so, like with the secret door, yeah, find the secret door. But it's when they're facing the lich on the other side and they fail those rolls. That's when they're gonna you know, get the uh, fulfillment of failure. And the, the the 
one one thing though that like that Octon Cthulhu did do that uh, the two twenty system does that I I do dig, but it does start making it feel board gamey after a while. Is like it it's converted into points called threat. Uh, so if they if they fail, uh, it's like okay we're gonna uh, have something bad happen to you or if I can't come up with something at that moment, because, you know, some, sometimes failure, it's really difficult to come up with a complication for it. Um, I can just add two threat to this pool and I can cash that in later for other things. It's kind of like a, the, a monetary device. The, the only problem is after a while, there's like so many different types of pools going on that it does begin to feel board gamey. Um, like, you know, it's a cool mechanic. I think they just kind of made it I think they got really into it. And now we've got, you know, basically three pools uh, going at all times with all these different things you can buy. Um, but I do like the idea of you're going to have something bad happen to you as a result of what happened, but I can't come up with it or I can't come up with an appropriate one right now, or I just want to get the game moving. So we're just going to put this as an IOU something bad later. As a you know, the the the, the karma is at least going to come back and get you in another way later, but I'm still going to let you have whatever it is you want, even though it's it's going to come back some point in the future. I do I do also like that idea of it, but I think that's more of an idea that I, I think that GM should actually keep in their mind rather than having to go through and count these uh, tokens and look at a price list for what they can buy with them. Um, it, it's kind of like the, when the concept of family forward really got into my brain, it's like, oh, okay. Now this is in my mental arsenal of how I can approach certain situations in the future. Uh, Absolutely. so I like that idea. Yeah. Yeah. And this is something that I feel like is, you know, developed, uh, especially with call of Cthulhu, uh, you know, back in the day when we were playing and, and trying to really adhere to the to the rules as they are written or the rules as we are interpreting them because uh, <laughs> that usually is what happens but you know in uh, we would play call of cthulhu and then we would attempt to do a skill roll to acquire a core clue and if we failed that skill roll the game master was like either well i don't know what to do since you failed it or they would just give up and go, well, you need this. I'm just going to give it to you anyways. And, you know, different games have been, uh, I mean, in particular because of the, uh, of that kind of, you know, failure to find a core clue in Call of Cthulhu, you know, we have the, uh, the gumshoe system, you know, where you don't even roll for clues. If the, character with the right skill is in the right place it's just given to you and that can have its own uh uh problems i i really like how call of cthulhu has matured as a game where you can still design your scenario where you might uh you know have to use a skill to acquire different clues but what you can do is you can have those clues be gradient you know there's the core portion and then there's you know this amount of extra info and that amount of extra info you know you can have levels of success and so if you go into a into a into a scene and use your skill to try and acquire a clue and you fail just as you were noting earlier you know you only get the core. You don't get the extra, you know, bonus stuff that could have come with it. So I like, I like that uh, maturity of Call of Cthulhu now. Well, you know, one of the things you're bitching like games didn't have skills, uh, you know, once upon a time. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think last year, last June, I brought back a, a player who I played with many years before, back when we used to play first edition slash second edition, that weird hybrid that we did uh, back in college. And, you know, he's continued playing that and, and other games like that. And then I brought him in, we played Call of Cthulhu. And in those games, there wasn't an, an awareness or spot or perception or whatever the games now call them. Uh, those are three different game terms for the, for the same thing. And so it was like, I searched the room 
and and they would actually tell me what it is they wanted. Like I look under the mattress, I, I pull out the drawers, I look on the other side of the drawers, I tap the bottom of the chest to see if there's a false bottom. And you know, that was kind of cool until you did it after so many times. And then it's almost like this checklist that comes out of like, you know, look under the look under the rug, look on the other side of the chairs, you know, uh, check all the bricks of the fireplace, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so when he had his first game with me and they're like, can we search the room? I'm like, okay, give me a spot. And you know, somebody got to say, okay, cool. Uh, so you're searching around and you find this in the cushions of the couch. And I, I give him the handout and um, he, he starts trying to push it. Like, okay, well, I'm going to start doing this. I like, yeah, yeah, you literally found everything, man. And like he was <laughs> so dead set that that's how you're supposed to search. Uh, however, I'm also the type where if if somebody actually does state i'm going to look in the couch and i know that's where it is i'm not even going to make them roll it's like well okay we actually you got it you know, you pull back the cushion of the couch and there's a quarter and you know ta-da i'm not going to have it where if there is something big there that they somehow missed it if they told me exactly where they're going to to look versus search the room or I'm going to search the, uh, the medicine cabinets, you know, like I'm going to look right here. Is it right here? Like, yeah, yeah, it's there. No role. Exactly. Uh, it, you know, I mean, that goes for, I mean, that's just, that's part of the, of the, the nuance of role playing. You might have a player who is so invested, they start describing and in character in voice on what they're saying to try and convince the NPC to, you know, help them out or do what they're, if they're, if the player is, is, is doing more than just saying, I want to convince the NPC to let us into the club and instead is talking to me in character and it's saying, listen, buddy, have you seen, you know, the, the people I'm with? They're super powerful. You don't want to be on their bad side. And, you know, they already know who you are. They know where you're working. This could go badly for you. I mean, that's a pretty convincing argument, you know. There's no need to roll. Yeah. You've persuaded him to let you in so he doesn't, uh, you know, this isn't the last day of his life, you know. I So I do that usually. Um, now, what I also might do is like, okay, give yourself a bonus die uh, at, at make a roll. Sure. Because then they yeah. fail. It's like, okay, here's the thing. You said all that stuff, but you had this grin on your face the whole time that you weren't able to suppress. Or so, so sometimes, yeah, I'll just be like, man, that's good. That works. Next. Um, but also, I'm the I'm the type that's like, well, we need a successful skill check for you to actually improve. So what we're going to do is I'm going to give you a plus because you did a good job and uh, let's see if you get it, uh, you know, or, or, or something uh, to that effect. So it, it really just kind of depends on the situation, the player, my mood uh, at sure. that exact moment, sure. the, um, you know, the specifics of who it is they're trying to convince, you know, is it somebody that's really serious about their job or are they just somebody that's like, man, I'm just waiting for this shift to end and then I can go home and like, you know, get, get back to my, my PlayStation or, or whatever. Um, so it, it kind of give and take. So yeah, sometimes I will just be like, yeah, that works. But very often I'll just give them a bonus um, and make them roll. And deep down, I'm really hoping they do. But you know, if they don't say, ah, oh, it didn't work, sorry. And you know, I'll, I'll usually come up with, yeah, you had a, you had a grin or at the last second you, you, you did, you, you broke. You know, you didn't say it the way, you know, the words were the same, but how you said it just didn't, didn't work. Sure sounded better inside your head. Didn't come out the way you wanted it to. Yeah, which that's something that I am intimately familiar with in real life. <laughs> <laughs> same. <laughs> but, but you know, for me, one of the things that I've just, I said, I found most concerning about a lot of the, the games or failures and options is just... Most of our stories that my my friends and I will talk about that happened, you know, five, 10, 20 years ago are are not we walked in the room and we kicked the monster's ass. It was usually like, do you remember that time? And then it's this orgy of failure story that that happens where some 
mundane task or, or something led to this cascading bizarre tale. Um, one of them which I've, I've talked about on my YouTube channel was when I had a barbarian who wanted to story a shield. And this, this epic tale took like an hour and a half, two hours or something where he ends up converting an entire town's religion. He blows up this building and all this stuff when it was originally supposed to be, Hey, just roll this roll. See if you've smashed this shield. And he just kept failing every time. And, and that's the story we remember. None of us could tell you what the adventure was in that session. All we can talk about is the barbarian and that stupid shield. And that was delightful. Um, or whenever we've done heist games, usually the heist parts that we remember most is when it all went wrong. Uh, like, oh, we had this great plan. It was so good. But then, and that's when the exciting part of the story is of I, when it all went wrong. Um, so I, I feel like games that take the option of failure out are, are kind of robbing uh the, the the players and the gm of those amazing stories of when all of a sudden everybody's improvising their butts off and oh, yeah. we're you know everybody everyone's adrenaline's up you know they're they're scanning their sheet like oh okay i've got i've got i've got a i've got a potion of 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 super slipperiness maybe somehow i can slip and slide underneath the, the bouncer you know whatever it is and they're they're coming up with some uh, rube goldberg machine solution to it that's just overly complicated and strange those are what we end up really really loving um and and, and i get the idea that you know you know you know failure is is not as much fun for players so we want them to always succeed and i i get that on one level but i i feel that some some of those games kind of swung that pendulum too far to where yeah. it's actually now robbing the best fun stories from them listen my my most favorite personal RPG story memory uh, is when me and my buddy we were thirteen years old. Um, it was it was Robert's thirteenth uh, birthday actually, and you know uh, a bunch of us were spending the night at his house and we played Call of Cthulhu right. And in hindsight, now I know. Because uh, this was back with uh, Call of Cthulhu as uh, first or second edition. I know we were using the first edition box set because it was the big two-inch thick box. But in hindsight, I know that uh, Robert was running the scenario that's in the core book called the Brockford House. But he had reskinned it, and um, the house was on an island. Uh, all of the player characters we were survivors of a of a shipwreck, so we washed up on this island where they're this deserted island where there just happens to be this, you know, Victorian mansion. And as there's we, always a Victorian mansion. Always a Victorian mansion. Home. Yes, exactly. If and Agatha we, Christie has taught me anything. <laughs> <laughs> as, exactly. Right. And as we explore the house and, and these, these, uh, uh, caverns that are below the house, we discovered a, uh, a serpent man nest, basically. And so I remember the ending of this thing as we were all trying to escape the house. Somehow I got redirected up a stairwell. Serpent men are coming out from all over the place, swarming up to try and get me. My buddies, they made it out of the house. They're running for the beach where the, where the little dinghy boat is that we had, you know, used from, from the uh, original shipwreck. So I'm, I made it to the second floor landing and there was this giant picture window and a chandelier hanging there. And, uh, and of course, Indiana Jones was, you know, super big at the time. So I'm like, I, I tell my, I tell Robert, you know, I said, my character leaps from the, from the landing to grab the chandelier, swing through the, that giant window, land outside and then race to the beach to catch up with all the other guys who were going for the boat. He was like, that's fantastic. Make a jump roll. Because, of course, Call of Cthulhu has a jump roll. And so I roll those dice. And as my character you know, swings across the chandelier and smashes through the window, I make my jump roll or attempt my jump roll to see what the result is. And it is a big failure and i he goes he adjudicated he goes you land and broke both your ankles as you land you can't walk 
And so I'm, <laughs> I'm laying there on the ground. And I remember I'm, I'm pleading to my, to my buddies, save me. And they're, and they're watching from the beach as serpent men are swarming over me. And they're like, you're dead already. And they went for the boat and left. <laughs> and that was the end of the scenario. And I was like, man, that was epic. That was so awesome. And that, I remember that to this day. So so mine, I was about the same age. I was 13. Uh, we were doing uh, the old AD&D Secret of Bone Hill. And we went to this place called Bald Hill. There were orcs on Bald Hill. And you know, we're 13, so we didn't think a lot of this stuff through. Uh, so like we're looking for a night falls. So we have a fire on the hill that doesn't really have trees on it. So of course they see us. Uh, they, they come in the middle of the night. I think they cast like a, a sleep or a charm or something. We all failed our saving throw. And the GM uh, is one of our dads. And he was at least smart enough not to just murder us. You're like, okay, you're all dead. Um, so we woke up the next morning, stark naked and, and like wet with a, the dew fall on the side of this hill. And our choices are, we can do the walk of shame back to town where like our, the rest of our stuff was, or we could just keep going. And of course we decided to keep going. So at that point I'm going through my memorized spells, which ones don't have material components. I can't use those. You know, we, we made it down to like some, some nearby woods and we cut like quarter staffs and like armed with like two sticks and the spells that didn't require material components that we weren't able to find or not have any, we had the most epic, amazing fight of, of any D and D game I had for many, many years of, you know, four naked idiots trying to take out the, the, the group of orcs. And we also had absolute teamwork because we couldn't, I'm going to go take those three over there and say, no, you're naked. You're armed with a stick. Uh, so we, we had to like really, really work together. And that was, such a wonderful memory, but it all came down to, we, we failed these saving throws and, it, and all this, but then we did have the fail forward. The GM did not murder us, but the, 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 the failures is what led to the amazing story that, you know, I, I look back and I cherish, you know, 30 years later. So I, I, yeah, I, I don't like the idea of games that deny that to to people um you know i'm fine with them denying the binary way we used to do pass fail which was like well you failed you're dead uh i'm fine with that i just don't like it where it's swung too far but anyway agreed well that's that's cool i i think uh i think that was a a lot to a lot to chew on for failure in uh, in your games why don't we try and I'm actually kind of scared now, uh, a, little, a little nervous <laughs> to, uh, to dive into this and, and let's start creating a, uh, a scenario. Okay. Well, uh, so, uh, a listener, Stephen Holmes, uh, and I, I guess it was on the, the discord, uh, had, had made a request and asked that maybe we write a scenario and, and kind of go through that process and kind of uh, show the process that's involved in, in writing a Call of Cthulhu scenario. Um, maybe see about uh, publishing it later through Miskatonic Repository. Uh, but we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Right now, mm, I'm like, let's yeah. just write a scenario. Um, so that's that's where that came from. So uh, once again, you can check out our Discord because we do listen to you know ideas and suggestions that were like, yeah, that'd be kind of cool. We can do that. Um, but then, uh, you know, several months ago, we had Mike Mason on, and we're talking about doing a, a low prep game. And Mike brought up the uh, the, the Call of Cthulhu uh, cards, and he just drew drew a couple of cards at random and basically outlined a scenario in just a minute. So, uh, one of the things I suggested to John, since we both do own these cards, is let's use those and let's start coming up with uh, the basic framework for a scenario. And then in a future episode, uh, we'll kind of show the, the flush out. So, this is actually going to be split up between multiple uh, episodes. We're going to do a lot of the tedium uh, between. <laughs> so, yes. 
but we can. I'm going to make you listen to us type and, yeah. and type, <laughs> and you can say that stupid and delete, and then retype it, and then say, "Oh damn, I should have kept the first one." Uh, we're gonna we're gonna spare listeners the uh, the horror show of what it's actually like, right? To do that, exactly. the, the, the grunt work. We're gonna at least share the fun part. Exactly, and I think this will be fun. You know, using these cards just to kind of give us a launching off point uh, to try and create something. So I think what we're going to do is uh, uh, we'll take turns pulling, randomize, and pull cards from from a deck. And I was suggesting that maybe we pull three cards and we see how those three feel. If need, me, if need be, maybe we use only two out of the three, but maybe we can use all three. Uh, but we kind of use each of these to, to start building the framework for this uh, scenario. Okay. Um, now, do we want to determine now or after we pull it out? Uh, are we want to do classic era, like 1920s? Are we want to do modern day? Are we want to do maybe gaslight? Uh, or do you want to just see what the cards say? I think we should start with the cards and then see how we feel uh, based okay. on that. Okay. So what do you want to begin with? So the cards, uh, Dex, because you, you've got like a fifth one because you're special. I've only got four decks, so you, you're going <laughs> to handle the monster one. Uh, so I've got unfortunate events, uh, curious characters, uh, then the, the weapons and artifacts, and then phobias. I think curious characters should be the one we yeah. begin with, right? Okay. So, once you start so I'm, I'm actually literally pulling these out of the box right now. Yeah. So I'm going to have to give them a shuffle. There you go. I should have maybe aligned them. That way they were all still facing up because they have portraits on the back. So now half of them are going up and half of them are going down. That was, that was, <laughs> that was smart. <laughs> okay. So three, huh? So yeah. Pull one from the top, on the middle, on the bottom. Okay, so my three characters are uh, Chloe Kirsner, movie star. Okay, and Bartholomew Crane the third, stage actor. Oh, hey. oh, that's a that's a nice little convenience. Okay, and then Nigel Hedenhammer, parapsychologist. One of these things is not like the other. <laughs> okay. So. In building us, uh, obviously, these guys are not the investigators. So these are the NPCs uh, and or uh, foes that the investigators are going to be working with maybe one of them is a victim may you know uh you know or a, an ally uh to the investigators somebody to kind of you know pull them into the scenario you know is are one of these three characters the uh, the jackson elias for this type of scenario that we're building right well because we've got the uh the movie star and the stage actor. So we at least have two two thespians. Uh, one's man, one's a woman. Uh, ages twenty eight is Bartholomew Crane the third, which you can't even call him Bart. You have to have the whole name. He's the older one at twenty eight. Uh, she is nineteen. Uh, man, they're both small. Both a, a build minus one and then a build minus two. These are like little midgets. <laughs> I guess what they say about actors is true. I right? they just just little <laughs> little hobbit people. Um, so we could have one be our victim, and the other either the the person that hires or the killer or cultist or the kidnapper. And then uh, we have a parapsychologist here. So if I was only going to choose two, I'd probably go with the the actors, but. I think what might be interesting is if we have one of them be ill-fated, uh, the other actor uh, possibly be the the bad guy, and maybe 
but maybe the uh, uh, Nigel, the parapsychologist, might be the contact that that gives them the gig. I like it. I like it. So let me kind of look over their 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 stats real fast. So Chloe is a little teeny thing. Strength twenty five. App ninety. She has Derringer. You know the actor can use a sword. So which one do you think should be our victim? And which one th should be our perpetrator? The much older man, twenty eight year old stage actor, or the much younger. 19 year old actress movie actress you know there's that rivalry especially if we're doing something like 1920s between stage and film i like the idea that uh chloe and bartholomew were a uh a hollywood item and bartholomew is now missing uh nigel maybe nigel how old is nigel by the way 33 33 oh, so that's not too bad that's a 33 year old and a 28 year old could could move in similar circles you know have similar friends and interests so um uh you know bartholomew is missing uh chloe is um you know distraught but maybe nigel thinks that they're crocodile tears and has brought the investigators in to help find the missing Bartholomew. And right now, he, you know, Nigel's <laughs> suggestion is that the the uh, the suspect well, is Chloe. Well, so Nigel is also very much into uh, the occult. Uh, it says, you know, one of his secrets he's been trying for years to contract his grandmother from beyond the grave. So he's obviously into. Uh, seances and stuff because it's a uh, you know parapsychology. Uh, so he's got a good occult. His psychology is fifty five. Uh, has forensics science at forty five. Uh, so maybe it is photography. Probably spirit photography. Maybe he believes he got a message from uh, from beyond. Oh, that's awesome. A message from Bartholomew telling him to find his killer. Yeah. I like that. And, um, and, and we don't so, know. Is Chloe involved or not? Maybe she is. Maybe she isn't. Oh, because it could also be Nigel did it. Uh, you know, Chloe, being a teeny little thing, could be also the person that's under the table during a, a bogus seance and knocking on the, the bottom of the table. Uh, so I'll, I'm going to pull these three cards out. Yep, we'll I, like it. I I I think this is a really good trio right here. Like I'm, I do like, too. Yeah, I'm excited I'm, about it. I'm gonna use all three like, of those. And, and the reason and, they're like, we'll get rid of one of them. I was like, okay, good, because man, using all three sounded stressful till I got all three. I was like, I don't want to get rid of one, John. <laughs> no, I I I'm totally there with you. I like it. I like it. All right, I want to I want to pull uh, a trio from the unfortunate events deck. Now we this one might be where we find that. Uh, Having three maybe uh, too much, so I'm gonna also give these a quick shuffle. Are you are you shuffling them directly on your microphone there? I know. Sorry. <laughs> 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 Try and move away here. But, uh, I don't have a lot. To no, no, no. Keep it. Keep it. Like, our, our listeners get to hear the raw sound of the, the raw sound of a of a shuffle. All right. Okay. So yeah, I'm gonna have shuffle now. I'll kind of fan out, and I'm just gonna kind of randomize and pull this and this and uh, looking away and pull that. Okay. So I've done. Oops. I've pulled three unfortunate events. All right. So, oh my. Uh, so the in this one. Yeah. So the first uh, unfortunate event, event is. Raining blood. It's um, raining blood. Yep. The rain, it's red. There's a sudden harsh wind blows and black clouds gather above you. Rain begins to fall. However, rain should not be red. Blood falls from the sky, covering you in seconds. There's a sand roll involved in that. Uh, the other event is an evil whisper. 
ooh, this might go well for the parapsychologist, you know, contacting the dead. The evil whisper is you hear someone whispering something nearby. It's so quietly spoken that you can hardly make it out. Nobody else seems to have heard it. You can't be sure, but you think it was, that's right, kill them all. That's interesting. All right, and then the uh, the third event is oh, what a what an unfortunate art for this one. The bad squid. Uh, okay, <laughs> bad squid. Ugh. Out of my way! I'm going to be sick. Despite a very enjoyable meal, something you have eaten does not agree with you. Perhaps it was bad squid. You sweat profusely, shiver, and shake as hot and cold flashes affect your body. A headache grows in intensity, and you find it difficult to focus and think clearly. Perhaps a day's rest will sort it out, or maybe you need to see a doctor. Uh, roll D4 plus 1. Determine how many days you are ill. Each day that you are ill, make a con roll. If you fail, lose one hit point. No, there's our failure. And uh, if the result is a hard success... Then your sickness clears up. Additionally, a successful medicine roll will get you back on your feet. While you are ill, strength decks, skills, and combat rolls are made with a penalty die. Those are our three events. I could see keeping a couple and ditching one, and I think we would ditch the squid. See, I was thinking the squid could be used as a poisoning. Oh, all right. Yeah. Well, talk to me. Convince me that we should keep the squid or convince and, you. Yeah. Should we keep all okay, three so, or keep only two? So or I, keep only one. I, 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 don't I know. dig the whisper. If we're doing the 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 the, the parapsychologist and the whisper, uh, yeah. maybe using that, that's that's cool. Uh, especially because if you know, maybe uh, we could have a, a scene where we do a seance and you know, we've got some combined pals and maybe we get to to hear a whisper or a mm -hmm. hint. Uh, maybe it's real, maybe it's not. Um, and then, uh, raining blood. I, I don't see that as like the climax. Like, I don't know if the investigators fail, it rains blood, and, and that's it. You know, but I, I do think that's a, a, a cool thing that, that could be done because that's more of a, of, of, a, of a mood thing. The bad thing is coming. Right. Or, uh, you know, if we, if we do the seance, maybe that is how the seance ends. You maybe it's raining inside this you know old Victorian house on a remote island somewhere uh, where we're holding the seance. <laughs> um, but then, in, instead of it just being bad squid, uh, we could be uh, poisoned food that's involved in that, uh, or some sort of uh, drug. Maybe a drug that's used to yeah. do the seance. Uh, maybe to trick people into a seance. There's actually a subtle drug that's given to the guests uh, before in the wine. And except for this time, the mixture was wrong. And now they're, they're ill and then it rains blood or, you know, something attacks and they're, uh, they're a little loosey goosey, or maybe they're poisoned and that serves as our timer. Yeah. Because oh, nothing, that's a great idea. nothing, you know, the doctors can't figure out what's wrong, except, you know, every day we're, you know, we're, we're maybe, you know, losing, you know, having to make a con check or lose a hit point. And maybe we don't get any hit points back. So it's like a long enough timeline, you're eventually going to lose all your hit points and die. So, or slip into a coma because you never had a major wound or, or something. But uh, that could serve as our, our timer. The investigators have to uh, find, you know, the solution before that because the solution will also come with the antidote yeah because the raining blood now that i think about it it feels more like a plague like biblical or egyptian plague whereas bad squid where that's just a label where it's what it's really talking about is an event of poisoning that seems like something that could be um part of a scene like you said it could be a seance that there's you know uh, an hors d'oeuvres or cocktails you know just kind you know just a preemptive you know because that's all part of the that's all part of the the, the scam of a of a uh, seance is to kind of loosen up 
the uh, the participants, you know, kind of get their inhibitions lowered, you know, with alcohol or something. And so, you know, maybe no, you maybe know, the prohibition, or you know, if we did it, if we do it in nineteen twenties when there's prohibition, there was so many cases of people being uh, poisoned off of bad alcohol, mm -hmm. uh, or it could be intentionally drugging the food well, either I, to I, to convince them to do it or because they're getting too close or maybe this is uh the same thing that our victim had where they got sick for a while and uh or maybe they're now in a coma and now the investigators are uh drugged too and they see their fate they have to solve the mystery uh get the antidote for themselves and for the victim uh in, in order to succeed, you know, maybe like they, they fall asleep and their pow is drained. And I was, I was thinking with the, uh, with the thespians that we've got, it might be kind of neat if this was like a 1970s Hollywood kind of thing. And, and the uh, seance, you know, there could be a lot of uh, drugs or marijuana and, and just, you know, you know they did drugs after the seventies, John. <laughs> <laughs> but you know the there's a room full of 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 uh, of smoke and you know there's something that's in the smoke that's uh that's affecting people so i think yeah we should keep the keep the inspiration of bad squid and uh i say we ditch raining blood well, let's keep that in the pipe maybe we can use keep it, it but pipe. i don't want right. to commit to that one all right. Um, like I, I like the idea of like that's an optional. If we could figure out a good way to work it in where it's not forced, let's do yeah. it. But All otherwise, right. but I do. We'll I love go. the evil whisper, and I love the thought now of the of the uh, incidental poisoning from you know was it bad squid? So all right, let's keep okay. those. Now, um, so the two other decks I have are as, uh, as weapons and artifacts. Mm -hmm. And then phobias. I can figure out where I set my phobias deck. Yeah, I was going to say, so do you want some phobias? Okay, okay. I have my weapons and artifact I'm ready, but I'll open up this box. I don't mind. It's like Christmas. Have you not even opened these before? I, I, I might have. I don't, I don't think so. I, you know, it wasn't until like Mike uh, showed us how to do it that I really ever. Uh, considered that aspect you know before i was like thinking that we would be using it in a way where um like oh you've got this phobia let me pull this desk deck out the uh, card out and i'll hand it to you and you've got all the description and then i was like that's just too much trouble i'll just read it to them and uh <laughs> yeah i never used them okay and we'll do three. Do you want to commit to one? Because uh, it's kind of harder to work in three phobias. I agree. Uh, than it is to like three characters. I mean, yeah. that's like a lot. So, one from the top, one from the middle, and one from near the bottom. Okay. Let's see what we got here. Uh, the first one. Xenophobia. Uh, so if you're strangers and foreigners, anyone perceived as different or unfamiliar is a potential threat, you know, sends your heart racing in terror. Okay. Okay. Ligromania. Uh, I have an uncontrollable compulsion to make loud noises, especially at improper times. Uh, there's no ah! to be quiet. <laughs> Like when they're trying to be quiet in a theater, uh, you know, sneaking through some cult's lair. Uh, so something that makes you very loud. Outlandish sounds when you're nervous. Um, if you see a balloon, you'll want to pop it. Uh, the picture is subdued, like crazily shooting a gun up in the air. <laughs> um, so you will, you will intentionally be trying to make loud noises. So it's not just necessarily yelling. It's just loud noises, banging doors or uh, that sort of thing dragging a metal pipe along a wall 
Oh yeah, the or the the, the across the metal bars and like an yeah. abandoned cell, like ding ding ding. Okay, man, you gave me phobias on purpose because you're gonna make me have to pronounce these crazy words. And you know that pronunciation is my kryptonite. So um my my subtle plan has come to fruition. Acmomania, acmomania. Uh, picture of it at, at, at like a doctor with a uh, syringe of green fluid and some woman screaming. So what is this? You have an obsession with sharp and pointed objects. Uh, either you have an unhealthy affection for sharp things, or you fear sharp things. Uh, sharp things including not knives, needles, forks, nails, pins, and so on. You might have a compulsive desire to collect sharp things, perhaps stealing to enhance your collection. Or you might f feel more of a need to be pierced when you see a sharp object. Man, this was like the winner for me right now, by the this way. This is the winner. This is the winner. Um, if you fear sharp things, you'll do all that you can to avoid them. You know, perhaps eating with blunt chopsticks rather than a knife and fork. You may even be overreact to being prodded with a finger. Uh, in the presence of sharp objects, you suffer, you know, different penalties and whatnot. Man, I think I'm going to go with this one. I don't know I if I would like, like to be. A lot. In fact, someone's got an obsessive nature toward it, or the it, the, the horrible fear of them. It, well, I'm thinking that whoever our villain is, whoever it is that that has done poor Bartholomew in, has if we should ever find Bartholomew, um, he will be discovered dissected split open with all of his organs spread out and they're all pinned like a like a frog dissection except he's on he's up on a wall and you know these these you know javelins or whatever are skewered through different parts of his body's uh, parts of his body with all of his organs spread out they're all they're still all connected they haven't been taken out you know haven't been separated from his body they've just been stretched out of the cavity and then pinned to the wall next to him so he's all spread out okay how about this instead of that um <clears throat> we've got the the hellraiser s hooks the chains with the hooks on the end mm -hmm. and he's got all the, the the hooks dangling from the ceiling and when they find him he is on a stage and there's like a marionette control and is you you could pull the different levers and you could actually you know move him and maybe other victims that are all like hooked through with these sharp little things to do a performance on a stage maybe they're live maybe they're not uh but uh this kind of like weird torture play that is pretty cool and actually a monster comes to mind well, you got to draw a monster. I know. I need to draw a monster. Maybe we'll oh. maybe, we'll see what happens. Is we'll your is quietly the stacking monsters. the deck? <laughs> like, we'll draw it randomly, Seth. Even yep. though I'm going to get the one I'm thinking. No, of. no, no, no. We'll draw. draw. And in fact, um, do you, you know? So, do you want me to do weapons, or do you want to do weapons, and I do monsters, or I've, am I going to do weapons, weapons and monsters? Um, I've got weapons. I'll take that since okay. I don't have a monsters deck. You get monsters. All right, you do that. So draw weapons for us and what i'll do is i'm going to hold on to the other two cards uh same thing if if we can figure out a way to naturally work them in mm -hmm. without it feeling forced or feeling too busy right um i say we do but we're not going to commit to them uh because we already found one that we definitely prefer Agreed. Yeah, you never know because as we as we build this scenario, there could be a scene where uh, the psychological penalty, if you were to fail a sand roll, could be one of these other uh, phobias that we've drawn. Or yeah, if or it, felt, it could if just it felt be organic for that. Like the xenophobia, I think would be real easy to give to an NPC that the Super player easy. characters go to their their house they have to ask them questions but it's this this xenophobe uh who's terrified of them because they're strangers and they have to uh get them to trust them in order to get whatever information so i i, I see ways we can work that one in the loud one a little bit harder uh you know i might just i might just say like we're gonna have a noisy child and call it a day but we'll, <laughs> i'll see if we can find a way to naturally work that that in I'm just pre-shuffling my deck. I want you to do weapons first. 
Oh, you want me to do weapons? Okay, well, yeah, I got my... We'll save monsters for the end. I got my thing right here. We'll see what we got. Oh, yeah. And this one, it looks like some idiot at some point went through and shuffled. Um, I'm thinking I'm the idiot because some of them are upside down. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we're going to do this weapons and artifacts. Maybe this is uh, an artifact that could be used, something the bad guy has, something that's necessary, something that's being stolen uh, mm -hmm, in addition mm -hmm. to. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what we got. Oh. One top. One middle... And then one near the bottom. Okay. Let's see if any of these are any good. Um, my first one. <laughs> Molotov cocktails. <laughs> okay. Um, so Molotov. Maybe there's an arson involved. Maybe it gets put out by blood rain. Um, I don't know. So at some point there's possibly a Molotov cocktail. A 45. Colt 45 automatic pistol. Okay. Old reliable. And a wood axe. There's oh, uh, for some, some creepy dagger, some ancient sword, or like, you know. Yeah. I, don't I know. mean, it feels like there's uh, two weapons of opportunity, right? A fire axe or a bottle of liquor. Turned into a Molotov cocktail. Or we could have, if the investigators get close, all of a sudden a Molotov comes in through the window. So, okay. None of those are really aspiring. Well, unless we're trying to solve a mystery, you know, a character was killed with a wood axe. Mm -hmm. um, sort of deal. Or just in the final layer, these are the available weapons that they might be able to find. Um, or, you know, the bad guy has access to, well, you know, he, he opens up his wonderfully tailored tuxedo and pulls out a Coke bottle with a rag. <laughs> <laughs> Just... <laughs> okay. And finally we got, we got monsters. Let's see. All right. Monsters. Here we go. Let's see what we got. So I've shuffled up the deck. I'm going to give it a couple of cuts here. Blind cuts. All right. So now. We're going to do, let's see, we'll do that, and we'll do that. Look, there, there was a lightning gun. They could have had a lightning gun. Oh, well. All kinds of weapons are in there. All right. Oh. Let's see. Oops. That one. Let's see. We'll get rid of that. All right. Here are the three. Okay. So. <sighs> oh, interesting. Uh, Vormis. A Vormis. You know, this doesn't have any lore, so I don't exactly know what a Vormis is. I think I remember reading him in the Peterson's Abominations, or Peterson's uh, little field guide. It it kind of looks like a, a werewolf of a sort, I think. Although chunky, like a chunky werewolf. Chunky werewolf! He's got uh, he's got a claw claw bite attack, or I guess he could attack with a weapon. So he's uh, he's intelligent enough or skilled enough and able to use a weapon. Uh, but his his stats he's uh, he's defeatable. I mean, it's not like he's he's completely overwhelming. He none of his uh, attributes are in the hundreds. I mean, they're all, they're all within human, uh, limitations. So he seems like a, uh, like a, uh, like a foe that could be, uh, you know, battled by humans and, uh, okay. doesn't have an overwhelming sanity loss. So yeah, he looks like a chunky well werewolf with human arms and stuff. Well, the, the Vormis, and uh, now I'm remembering uh, where these are uh, from, 
Uh, they have they are a creation of the serpent people. Ah, and uh, has to do with the elder god Desagua. So I I, I used Vormus in Two Headed Serpent. That's where I knew that name from, uh, because I remember when I read that, I was like, I am not familiar with these monsters. What what is this? So, um, but that is a serpent person link. And they were kind of like, um, uh, in, in that one, they were the origin of troll folklore. Okay. These really big, uh, things that basically the serpent people had, had bred to be like large and dumb, these like manual laborers, mm -hmm. but they were like big. So. Um, and they were, they were, uh, and that when they had these collars, these shot collars, if they, they didn't follow orders, uh, because they actually hated the serpent people as these oppressors, but, um, but they were willing to, you know, do horrible things because they were monsters, but they were kind of sympathetic as how they're presented in that. So, okay. That's interesting. I mean, cause for this, I wouldn't think that they're that big cause their average build is a one average hit points are 11 so with a move rate of nine i mean all of that seems very human their average damage bonus is plus one d4 i mean they seem incredibly human adjacent you know <laughs> um so the vormis one of the other monsters that we drew is a formless spawn so those are formless spawn of Tosagua. Yeah. And the Vormus. Uh, so we could be looking we, at a, a Sathagua cult here. Because uh, when, when I pulled up uh, the, the seventh edition keeper rule book and I just typed in Vormus, which is V O O R M I S. Correct. Okay. Um, Worship of the servant people and the furry subhuman Vormus in ancient times. So they were worshippers of Tosagawa. And now we've got a formless spawn. A formless Ooh. spawn. Yeah. The spawn of Sathagawa. Yeah. There you go. So that's that's pretty cool. And you know, of course, the formless spawn, these are more of a monstrous kind of monster. You know, they're they're larger. They've got an average build of three, average build of or average hit points of 17. So again, they're getting um, a little more difficult to kill. They have a, a slightly more powerful uh, sand hit. So yeah, I like that. And I like that, you know, Vormis and Formal Spawn are, you know, in that Sathagua cycle. You know, one thing that works great on them? Molotov cocktails. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> There you go. Um, in fact, oh, you know, you say that, but you'd be wrong. Really? We used all sorts of flamethrowers on them in Two Headed Serpent. Are they immune to fire? What the oh, no. Nope. Sorry. I misread that. They're immune to mundane. It even says enchanted, immune to mundane and enchanted weapons, but fire, chemical explosions, and cold base only inflict a D six. Hmm. So there you go. All right. Okay. The what's third, number three? The third the monster saga himself. <laughs> now third monster breaks this, breaks that cycle and just is, uh, kind of strange. It's a uh, courtiers or the, uh, the courtiers of the King in yellow. So these are, I'm not familiar with the courtiers, but I do know the king in yellow is often associated with plays. And we do have two actors. One of them is a stage actor. That's true. Uh, though I am, I'm, I usually kind of get like, eh, whatever I did counter king in yellow stuff and dealing with a play. Uh, just because that's like so done. But there is, there is a link there. There is a link. I feel like we'd be forcing it though. These uh, these courtiers of the king in yellow are just minor nuisances, really. Um, they have almost no sand hit, so they're not they're not really scary at all. And they attack either with a weapon or with the the uh, 
the lashings of their robes. The just the they can basically do a towel snap at you. Um, okay, what do they look like? They look like dancing humans, dancing humans with uh, with masks over their over their heads. Okay. We might be able to work that in if, uh, not directly though, we can at least pull in a, like a nod. If we have uh, something with the actors, there might be a, a cult or some sort of weird thing they do where there's a, a masked dance thing. And it doesn't even have to be them. It can just be kind of in that vein of, of a similarity. Uh, it well, could be yeah. that there is a fledgling cult that stole something from the, the Sagawa cult, and that has led to this. Um, yeah, they could be courtiers could... of the Sathagwa. Yeah. Uh, or we could have... Um, yeah. So we, we've got the, we've got actors who've got a parapsychologist, love the idea of doing a seance. We've got possible poisoning. We got the saga of a link. We got two there, so I think that's probably the one we're gonna have to go with. Um, and you thought 1970s? Is I thought the your... 70s would be fun in L.A. Hollywood land. 1970s, kind of a kind of something going okay. on. Uh, okay, we can. Yeah, we can do that. So what we'll need to do is just do some brainstorming. Kind of uh, throw back, throw out some ideas, and uh, kind of start hammering it out because we're gonna have to come up with the minor NPCs and a plot, right? Um, and I assume we're gonna do this as a full group versus like a one-on-one -on -one type game. I don't, man, I don't want to throw one character against a <laughs> formless spawn. Yeah, no, no. This is this will be a team of investigators. You know, uh, between four and six investigators uh, is what you would assume would be playing this. Yeah, so there we go. Let's, let's okay. do that. So, um, well. yeah, do you like the idea of uh, 1970s Hollywood? Yeah, we'll do it. Okay. We're going to have to we're gonna have to do a little bit of research there, so, but we can... Which would be our next step. Okay. So we'll do some research in a 1970s Hollywood. Uh, probably a little research on the, the Cthulhu mythos lore towards Tasagua and the Vormus mm -hmm. and uh, really kind of hammer out the details of the because we did throw out a bunch of ideas, kind of figure out which ones we want to do, which ones we want right. to elaborate on <laughs> and uh, see what all we can uh, work in out of the optional cards and see how we can get the ones that we have committed to to work. I like it. I like it. This will be fun. So uh, uh, follow along as we uh, as we build on this idea. Uh, you know, we could integrate and kind of between shows, we could start a thread on the Discord for this idea and just kind of, you know, start putting our, our, our thoughts there and uh, kind of start working you know workshopping there in the in the discord uh, so listeners can kind of follow along and and help us with uh, some ideas and then we can uh, come back and we'll have our next part of this where we've talked about the research that we've done and and how we've progressed in putting this together okay i like it all right this should be fun this I think this will be fun. Let's. Uh, I want to say thank you to our patrons. Um, if you enjoy the work that uh, Seth and I are doing and would like to support us, please consider joining our Patreon. It's at uh, patreon.com forward slash modern underscore mythos. And as we've mentioned a few times in this episode, we do have a Discord, and we've got the link down in the uh, show notes for the Discord invite. Please jump in, follow along, throw out any ideas for any future episodes, or uh, since John has kind of passed along the idea that maybe we'll stick this up on the Discord as a, uh, a good spot for brainstorming, uh, if you've got any cool ideas based off of what we've already uh, started brainstorming, maybe throw something on there and we can see if we can work that in. 
And we do have a, a, a Facebook uh, for Modern Mythos, which you can join in and uh, you know, see, see what we're talking about. We usually post updates or any events there. And we have an RSS feed that you can use to just inject into your favorite podcatcher and uh, get the show there as well. We also have a Redbubble store, so if you want to get a Modern Mythos t-shirt or a sticker and possibly some other things in the future, right now all we have are t-shirts and stickers with our uh, wonderful logo on it, please check out our Redbubble store. Uh, links below in the show notes. We cannot do this show alone. We want to thank our amazing editors, Max Mahaffa and Edwin Nagy, for all their hard work and skills and in making us sound really awesome. So thank you, guys. Thank you. And also a huge thank you to John Sumro for our amazing badass logo. He's a very talented artist, so please follow him on Facebook if you are active on Facebook more than John and I are, but definitely check out his official website. Uh, please consider joining his Patreon account. Once again, links down in the show notes. Finally, we want to thank the Darkest of the Hillside Thickets for generously allowing us to use their song, Gluttony, as our intro and outro music. Uh, if you are a fan of the Lovecraft's writing and the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game, then you really need to check out the Darkest of the Hillside Thickets. Uh, please check out their Bandcamp site and their official band website. Links for those are also in the show notes. Thanks for listening. Thank you.